In this video, I'll be discussing thrombocytosis. By the end, you'll be able to define thrombocytosis, to list its etiologies, and to describe the basic pathophysiology, presentation, diagnosis, and treatment of essential thrombocythemia and polycythemia vera, two of the most important causes of primary thrombocytosis. Thrombocytosis is simply a state in which the platelet count is above the upper limit of normal, which most labs define as around 450,000 platelets per microliter. As with thrombocytopenia, some completely normal healthy individuals will have platelet counts above this value, but the farther it is from this cutoff, the more likely there is some underlying pathology. As a very general rule, clinically relevant thrombocytosis is a less common problem than thrombocytopenia. The causes of thrombocytosis can be divided into two categories, secondary thrombocytosis, also known as reactive thrombocytosis, and primary thrombocytosis, also known as autonomous thrombocytosis. Primary thrombocytosis is a situation in which overproduction of platelets is a direct part of the central pathology. Perhaps unexpectedly, I've listed secondary thrombocytosis first to emphasize that it's much more common. Despite that, Secondary thrombocytosis only rarely requires specific treatment other than that directed at the underlying cause. Common etiologies of secondary thrombocytosis include any acute infection, solid organ malignancies, some forms of anemia, specifically iron deficiency, hemolysis, and acute hemorrhage, chronic inflammatory disorders such as autoimmune disease and chronic infections, and post-splenectomy. The five notable causes of primary thrombocytosis include essential thrombocythemia, polycythemia vera, myelodysplastic syndrome, myelofibrosis, and chronic myeloid leukemia. MDS and MF are actually more commonly associated with thrombocytopenia, but a significant minority present with thrombocytosis instead. When differentiating between these two general categories, that is primary versus secondary thrombocytosis, the presence of either symptoms directly related to the thrombocytosis, such as vasomotor symptoms to be discussed in a minute, or a platelet count above 1 million strongly suggests primary thrombocytosis. There's honestly not much more to say about secondary thrombocytosis, so I'm going to focus the rest of the video on the two most notable causes of primary thrombocytosis. First is essential thrombocythemia, or ET. ET is a chronic myeloproliferative neoplasm. That term is used to describe any slow-growing cancer in the bone marrow, which results in the overproduction of one or more type of blood cell. In this case, ET results primarily in the overproduction of megakaryocytes, which are the precursor cell to platelets. Most cases are related to mutations that affect the JAK-STAT signaling pathway, but can also involve the receptor for thrombopoietin, which is a growth factor regulating the growth of some blood cell lines. Moving to the clinical features of ET, roughly one half of patients are discovered incidentally by a CBC checked for an unrelated indication. When present, symptoms and complications can include so-called vasomotor symptoms, including headache, visual disturbances, lightheadedness, atypical chest pain, and something called erythromelalgia, which I'll come back to. As you might expect from an unusually high platelet count, patients can develop thrombosis, leading to MIs, strokes, DVTs, PEs, and first trimester pregnancy loss. Unexpectedly, however, ET is also associated with an increased risk of a variety of hemorrhages. Also counterintuitively, the risk of thrombosis decreases and hemorrhage increases when the platelet count exceeds 1 million. So why is that? It appears to be the result of those patients developing an acquired form of von Willebrand disease, which is related to qualitative platelet disorders that will be covered in the next video. ET can also cause splenomegaly. I want to come back to one of the vasomotor symptoms, erythromelagia. This symptom is not specific to myeloproliferative disorders, and most patients don't experience it, but it is one of the more classically described hallmarks of these diseases. It's characterized by episodes of red discoloration and hot, burning-like pain in the distal extremities. 
Swelling is sometimes present. It's usually symmetric, with the feet more commonly affected than the hands. Episodes are often triggered by an increase in ambient heat or physical activity and last minutes to hours before resolving. Alleviating behaviors include actions to cool the affected extremity, including immersion in cold water or the application of ice packs. Although affected areas are not painful between attacks, they may feel cold to the touch and have a purplish discoloration to them. How does one diagnose ET? On the CBC, red and white blood cells are usually normal or near normal, and aside from the thrombocytosis, the only other commonly present abnormality on conventional labs is platelet anisocytosis on a blood smear, which refers to increased variability in platelet size, demonstrated here. A conclusive diagnosis of ET requires all four of the following features. Thrombocytosis, a bone marrow biopsy showing proliferation of the megakaryocyte lineage, demonstration of an ET-associated mutation, specifically in JAK2, CalR for the calreticulin gene, or MPL, the thrombopoietin receptor gene. And last, an absence of a concurrent hemoproliferative disorder associated with thrombocytosis, such as PV, MDS, or CML. Currently available treatments for ET are not curative and do not prevent transformation into MDS or AML. Instead, treatment is for the reduction of symptoms and prevention of thrombosis. Treatment algorithms are complicated and evolving, but the very general options include close observation, which is only appropriate for asymptomatic low-risk patients with no cardiovascular risk factors, aspirin, hydroxyurea plus aspirin, or hydroxyurea plus anticoagulation plus or minus aspirin if there is a history of venous thrombosis. Moving on to PV, it is also a chronic myeloproliferative neoplasm. The hallmark of PV is an increased red cell mass, which practically speaking means an increase in the serum hemoglobin to above normal levels. Roughly one half of patients with PV also have leukocytosis, and one half of patients have thrombocytosis. Some fraction of PV patients will have both of these, and some fraction will have neither. Almost all PV patients, however, have a JAK2 mutation responsible for their disease. When present, symptoms, signs, and complications include some of the same as ET, vasomotor symptoms, thrombosis, and hemorrhage. But there are a few additional ones seen in PV. In particular, pruritus following a warm bath or shower, which can be severe. This unusual symptom is sometimes called aquagenic pruritus. Patients with PV also develop hypertension and splenomegaly. To establish a diagnosis of PV, the patient must have either an elevated hemoglobin and or hematocrit, and a hypercellular bone marrow with trilineage growth, and either a JAK2 mutation or an abnormally low serum erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is a hormone produced by the kidneys, which drives the production of red blood cells. It is increased in chronic hypoxemia. So the finding of an unusually high erythropoietin in a patient with polycythemia would suggest that the polycythemia is an, an adaptive response to chronic lung disease and or high altitude, and not from a myeloproliferative disease. Erythropoietin-producing tumors are also a very rare cause of such secondary polycythemia and also would not be considered PV. With treatments, as with ET, those for PV are not curative and do not prevent transformation into a more aggressive malignancy. So once again, treatment is for the reduction of symptoms and prevention of thrombosis. General options include phlebotomy alone in order to target a hemoglobin concentration in the normal range, phlebotomy plus aspirin, or phlebotomy plus hydroxyurea plus aspirin. However, aspirin should be avoided in patients with evidence of acquired von Willebrand disease. So I know that ET and PV sound really similar in presentation, associated gene mutations, and general treatment options. So here's a summary slide that you can use to compare and contrast them. 
I won't read through it, but you can pause the video and read over it if you like, or take a screenshot for reviewing at a later time. This is the end of my discussion on thrombocytosis. The next video will cover qualitative platelet disorders, including von Willebrand disease.